Hi, I'm Reverend Kim Polchow from Marshfield United Methodist Church, and this is episode one, part one of the United Monarchy. So what is the United Monarchy? Well, the United Monarchy is a period of Israelite and Judean history in which Israel in the north and Judah in the south were together as one kingdom. But it's bigger than that. It's much, much bigger than that, because up until this period, Israel and Judah, they didn't have kings. And it is a major shift in how the Bible talks about um, the world. It's a major shift in what is going on politically. We're going to start having rulers and rulers are going to do good things and they're going to do awful things. And this is a pivotal moment for understanding the Hebrew Bible. Up until this point, we've had uh, the books of Genesis and Exodus. And in Exodus, of course, we learned that Moses takes the people out of slavery in Egypt and into the, the desert where they wander for 40 years until they cross into the promised land, which is Canaan. In the book of Joshua, which comes next and follows up after Exodus, we learn all about how Joshua and the Israelites sort of conquered the promised land. And we end Joshua with the feeling that it's all taken care of. They're home. They're in the promised land. And then you open the book of Judges. And the next book, Judges, is full of skirmishes and big problems with the Canaanites. Now, they're not always called Canaanites in the Bible, in the Hebrew scriptures. We're mostly going to call the people of the promised land Canaanites and Israelites. But there are other terms used. So sometimes when they're talking about the past, they will describe the Canaanites as Amorites. And in scholarly circles, when they're talking about the culture of the Canaanites, they're going to use the word Akkadian with, with two Ks, okay, Akkadian. That's going to be the word that refers to Canaanite culture. We end Judges. We've had this uh, cycle throughout Judges. I teach about the Judges cycle early on in the Bible study, having men for dinner, biblical women's deadly banquets. That's already here on YouTube. If you want to find that, you can learn all about the cycle of the judges. Basically, just to recap, there's the cycle of the people uh, being good and then misbehaving and stepping away from God, maybe worshiping other gods, and then they get into trouble. They get conquered by some uh, neighbors, some group of Canaanites usually, and then um they call out to God for help and they repent to their sin and God raises up a judge and the judge comes in and the judge leads them and they turn everything around and they win and then the judge dies. <laughs> so that's basically the judges cycle in a nutshell. We're going to meet the last judge of Israel in this study, Samuel, and we're going to see the transition from a judge leadership model to a kingship model. And we're going to talk about Saul and David and Solomon, who were the kings of this united, united monarchy, right? So pivotal time. When we talk about Canaanites in this 12th century BCE is sort of how I'm going to set the stage. This is a major, major world culture shift in the 12th century BCE. We're talking about the time of the Trojan War. We're also talking about the collapse of all of the major civilizations of the Mediterranean. Now, when I say that, we'll get into that a little bit more, what some of the elements were. We're going to start with where the Canaanites were. And let me say, the Canaanites are not one of those major civilizations we're talking about because the Canaanites were mostly kind of an agrarian people. You know, they farmed. They were starting to use terracing to eke out any kind of living from, from the desert, from the area where they lived. They had to do terracing. They had to stick with it. So they were mostly farming, and they never developed a unified state. The Canaanites never had, like, a unified government. They were very, very tribal, and they were in sort of just like segments. 
There is the thought that there was some kind of major climate change going on at this time. In the 12th century, we start a 150-year drought, which is very unusual. And that destabilizes course, all of the cultures there. It's hard to have enough food for your people in a drought. It's hard to have a stable situation in your country if you don't have enough food. If you don't have enough food, then you can't go out and trade. If you can't go out and trade, then you can't make bronze. And this is the late bronze age. And you had to have all these different metals that came from different places. So there was a lot of global trade going on. What are the Canaanites doing? The Canaanites are pretty much kind of staying home, battling with the Israelites over the land. And they're not really a big player, a big player on the world stage. So when we talk about the Canaanites, we're not really talking about an ethnic group. We're talking about real estate. We're talking about where they lived. I mean, Canaan, right? The promised land and the Canaanites. It's sort of the people who lived in Canaan. So sometimes you see different words for the different groups of the Canaanites. It's a real estate consideration. It's the people who lived in Canaan. They have distinctive pottery. They have distinctive uh, structures, distinctive architecture, in other words. And we know what Canaanite looks like. As we go into the 12th century BCE, you have the Canaanites who are on the promised land and they have uh, tribes and tribal leadership and they are surrounded in the Mediterranean by organized governments with kings. So they are organized monarchies all around the Canaanites. And the Canaanites are just sort of eking out their living in the land without a really organized system of government. Let's talk about some of the neighbors of the Canaanites, some of these monarchies around them. So the first one we're going to talk about are the Hittites. Sometimes at this period of time, they're called the Neo-Hittites or the Syro-Hittites. They are from a uh, part of Turkey, Syria, and they're sort of in the north of Canaan. They've got some area there. And the Hittite people have their own kind of pottery. They have their distinctive form of dress, and they have major political problems. So the Hittite empire is going to collapse around 1180, and some of the Hittites are going to move into their northern territories of Canaan and settle there. And that's going to put some pressure on the Canaanites, right? Because now we're sharing land with the Israelites and we're sharing land with these uh Syrian, Turkish, Hittites, right? These these other people. We also have our neighbors, the Egyptians. The Egyptians have been important uh, in the story of Israel, very, very important in lots of ways and at lots of point during their history. Shown here is the inscription on the Merneptah stele, which was found in Thebes. It's dated to uh, t around 1200, and it is an Egyptian stele that talks about a uh, war with the ancient Libyans. And then the last few lines actually talk about something with Canaan, and Canaan is mentioned, but also Israel is mentioned, and it's or the Israelites, and it is one of the first mentions outside of the Bible uh, in an external source of Israel. So during this 12th century, Egypt is severely weakened, and they've set up kind of this new kingdom of Egypt that is smaller than it has been before. They're not going out and conquering new territories and being an empire right now. They are shoring up, and they're getting smaller and weaker. And so if you have the Egyptians to the south getting weaker and you have the Hittites falling in the north and getting weaker, there's a little bit of a power vacuum here. These were big world players and all of a sudden they're very weak. So why are they weak? 
This is one of the most intriguing points, I think, in world history, because something was definitely going on. So I've talked about possibility that there was climate change going on that caused this drought. There's a great article linked in the description of this episode that that will talk about how scientists are looking into the possibility of climate change in this time period to see how much of a factor that was. The big issue that we know happened during this time, and we know because of the historical record, we know from Staley's and uh, from other historical documents, of course, we're talking about clay documents at this point that were left behind that talk about what was going on, particularly in Egypt. They're commonly called the Sea Peoples. The Sea People came. We don't know who the Sea People were specifically. We do know that they were probably um, more European. They have a different entire style of language than the people in the Mediterranean. So a little more European from the West. And they're coming in and they're settling. They're not just coming in and raiding and taking things, although they are doing that. They're coming and they're fighting and they're winning and they're also staying. So the sea people have attacked the Hittites and collapsed their empire. They have attacked Egypt. They were able to take their outposts, but not their main country. So Egypt is shrinking. The Hittites are kind of moving into Canaan. Everyone's reacting to these sea peoples that, that came into the world. And that's that major world history mystery. Who are the Sea Peoples? I don't know. They might have been some sort of early Greeks. They might have been people coming out of the Trojan War. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of thoughts. So I'm going to include an article in the description that you can read that's more about the mystery of the Sea Peoples. We run into the Sea People in the Bible. The Israelites give them a very distinctive name that you've heard. If you've ever heard any story of David, like the story of David and Goliath, or when David was a mercenary for the other side, he worked for the Philistines. And the sea peoples that land on the Levant or uh, the Holy Land area, that those people are labeled Philistines. And they set up a five-city pentapolis, and they have this little like five-city area that's there on a map, and that's where the Philistines were. And so when we run into David and the stories of David before and after, we keep running into these people called the Philistines. And of course, most people don't know their Hebrew history. They don't realize that the Philistines are something drastically different from the Canaanites. I mean, we kind of read this as like they're all foreigners. The Canaanites weren't all that foreign. But the sea people are something completely different. They came and wherever the sea people went, they had better technology. They had better tactics. They won. So when you couple that with this drought, possible climate change, the need to sort of stay on the land because it's terraced, and in come these foreigners with their boats and their tactics, and they can just win, and they don't have any kind of language you understand, civilization got very, very destabilized in the Mediterranean in this period. That's when we meet the Israelites again at the end of their judges period. And they have all the same pressures as these Mediterranean cultures that are collapsing. What they don't have is a central government. And they start to wonder if maybe it isn't time. So I'm going to show you some pictures of the culture of the Israelites. And you're going to realize you've seen these slides before. So one of the tricky things about biblical archaeology and, and reading the Bible as a person of faith and then looking at the historical record is that we have to be faced with some truths that might make us uncomfortable. And here's a big one. It is impossible to tell an Israelite piece of pottery from a Canaanite piece of pottery from the same period because they were basically the same people with different religions. So remember I said Canaanite is more about real estate than ethnicity. So the Israelites 
have been fighting with the Canaanites, sharing with the Canaanites, conquering the Canaanites, being conquered by the Canaanites, back and forth. Culturally, they're pretty much the same people. They have the same houses. They have the same pots with the lip around the rim. They do the same kinds of inscriptions. They have different gods, different understanding of God and how the world works, but they're pretty much the same people culturally. By the time we meet the Philistines in the stories of David, the Philistines have been on the ground for a while. Now, one of the questions I always wanted to know was, are the Philistines the sea peoples? Are they a kind of the Sea Peoples? The Sea Peoples are a big mystery. What we do know is the Israelites who dealt with the Sea Peoples dealt with them in Philistia. They dealt with this Pentapolis, these five cities, and they called those people the Philistines. So that's what the Israelites named these people who came from the sea at the same time the rest of the Sea Peoples were there. I think it's silly to pretend they're not related to the to the sea peoples. So they've blended in some way. They're even the Philistines are even serving Dagon, who is a Canaanite god, and and we're going to run into them now with David. So that wraps up the setting of the stage for the change that's going to happen that creates the united monarchy. We've talked about the external pressures that were on Israel as they dealt with this massive change in the world around them. And now we're going to look in in the next episode on what the internal pressures were. And for those internal pressures, we're going to turn to the book of First Samuel. This is one of those really interesting periods in the Hebrew scripture history where the Hebrew scriptures and the historical record are marching side by side and we can get information from both to understand where we really are. I hope you'll join me for part two of episode one, United Monarchy.